My name is Andreas Miller, and I'm Associate Research Scientist at Columbia University. I'm also one of the core developers of the Scikit-Learn Machine Learning Library. And so today I want to talk about, um, well, first I give a brief introduction on what is Scikit-Learn, and then I will talk about uh, what recent developments are and what we're working on. So let me just switch to the slide deck. Yes, this will be an update on Scikit-Learn. So the current release we're working on is 0 0.20. Um, there's a release candidate out for that, and I'll talk about this in a little bit. So uh, my work on Scikit-Learn has been funded by the NSF and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And of course, this is not, I'm not talking about my work here only. This is work of a giant community with many, many people contributing. So, but let's step a, take a step back and talk about what is Scikit-Learn. So Scikit-Learn is a machine learning library for Python. So it's a tool that helps you write machine learning models um, using Python. So you need to program to do it. There's no GUI or something like this. It's uh, a programming tool for using in Python. It's not actually written in Python entirely. It's also written in um, Python partially, um, but it's uh, easy to use from Python or it can only be used from Python. So I want to talk about uh, the basic API of uh, Scikit-Learn uh, briefly. So Scikit-Learn contains a lot of different machine learning models, um, particularly for classification and for regression, but also for clustering and dimensionality reduction, manifold learning, uh, all kinds of different textbook um, algorithms that you can think of. Most of them are Scikit-Learn together with tools for doing uh, pre-processing and model selection, cross-validation, grid search, and so on. So Scikit-Learn assumes that your data is given as a two-dimensional NumPy array, um, and we usually call that capital X, where each row corresponds to uh, one sample in your data set, and each column corresponds to one feature. So um, let's say you want to predict about users, um, that visit your website, then each row would be uh, a single user and each feature would be a characteristic, like how often was it, did they visit your website um, or how long did they stay on the website, and so on. For supervised tasks like classification and regression, we also have um, outputs or labels, which are a separate variable that we usually call lowercase y. So um, in a classification example, this could be did the user click on an ad, yes or no? Or uh, if you have a web shop, that could be uh, how much money does, did the user spend, which would be a regression task. Given this data in X and Y, all of the models in Scikit-Learn are implemented with the same pretty simple interface. So let's say you want to use a classification model like the random forest classifier all of the models are implemented in uh, Python classes. So there's a Python class in Scikit-Learn that implements the random forest classifier. If you want to use this model, you have to first instantiate it. Then you can build the model using the fit method. The fit method gets both um, the characterization of the data, so the training data X train, and the desired outputs Y train. So this is, for example, a description of the users visiting your website together with whether they clicked on a particular ad or not. Using these together, the machine learning model is built and stored in this CLF object. Then um, if we wanna make a prediction, if we want to apply the model to new data, uh, we can use the predict method on uh, data that's represented in the same way as Xtrain here. It, uh, it's called X test. So this is, let's say, observations of uh, new users that come on our website and predict will tell us what does the model think? Um, will they click on the ad or not? So this is the prediction according to the model. Finally, if we have um, a whole our test data set for which we know the targets, we can also evaluate uh, how well does the model do um, basically in hindsight using the score method for classification models, this is always accuracy. And for regression models, that's always R square. So the CLF.score 
will apply the model um, to X test. So we'll compute predictions on X test and then we'll compare them against some uh, known ground truths, uh, Y test, and we'll see how well does this model do. As I said, the interface for algorithms in scikit-learn is the same everywhere, basically. So uh, all models are, are Python classes, and they all have a fit method with um, the parameters x and y. And um, all the classification regression models have predict and score methods. So there's a couple of um, other methods, or there's a, a couple of um, other models in scikit-learn. So basically, everything has a fit method. If it's a supervised model, it gets x and y, where y is the desired output. If it's an unsupervised model, it only gets uh, the data x during fitting. And you would always use the predict method to make a prediction, um, which is sort of an outcome variable. So that's the case for classification, regression, and clustering. If you want to transform your data into a new representation, like uh, scaling or applying principal component analysis or something like this, you would use the transform method. So that's used in pre-processing, dimensionality reduction, feature selection, and feature extraction. So these three are really the three core methods in scikit-learn. So everything has fit on depending on whether something is one of the methods on the left or on the right, they have either predict or transform or sometimes both. As I said, there's um, a lot more tools in scikit-learn for doing machine learning. So for example, there's um, tools for doing grid search and cross-validation. So here's an example of um, using grid search CV and um, train test split to adjust the parameters of a model. So this is sort of a very basic standard application where we start with a data set that we collected. It's uh, the data is in X, the targets are in Y. We split the data into a training part to build a model and a test part to evaluate how well our model does. We want to use um, a particular machine learning model here SVC is a kernel support vector machine. And um, we want to adjust the two hyperparameters, C and gamma. So if you want to build this model, you usually have to adjust uh, both of these parameters to get good performance. And so if you want to perform um, grid search with cross-validation, we can create a grid search object, which basically wraps this um, support vector machine object and um, we create a new object grid using a grid search CV, which does the grid search and cross validation and uh, SVC, which is the support vector machine. And we give it a parameter grid of parameters to switch over. So here we say, try these different values for C, which are sort of an logarithmic grid between um, 0.001 and um, 100 and gamma, which are in the same range. So this grid search CV object uh, behaves again exactly like all of the other models in scikit-learn. So it has a fit method. We can call the fit method on the training data set. Um, so X train and Y train. What the fit method does in this case is it will perform uh, cross validation internally. Um, for each possible combination of the C and gamma uh, parameters we set, it will build a super vector machine, uh, train it on um, like some, uh, I guess the training folds in the cross validation, evaluated on the holdout folds. And uh, then it will in the end decide which one is the best combination of parameters. We'll rebuild the model with the best parameter setting on the whole training set and then store it in grid. That all happens in fit. Then if we call predict, it'll use this best model with the best parameter setting to make predictions on the test set. And we could, um, also used uh, the score method to see how well they we perform uh, on the test set. So this is a very sort of standard application of scikit-learn. Another important component in scikit-learn is um, pipelines. So pipelines are a tool to encapsulate machine learning workflows. So usually you don't only apply um, 
a classification or regression model, usually you need to transform your data into the right representation. At least you need to do scaling of your data. Maybe you need to do feature selection, impute missing values, and so on. And because basically each application of machine learning is such a more complex workflow, uh, the pipelines allow you to encapsulate all of this into a single uh, Python object, a single scikit-learn estimator. The estimator is what we call uh, our models. So here, uh, this diagram shows, let's say you have two transformations, T1 and T2. Say um, T1 is imputing missing values, T2 is scaling. And uh, then you have a classifier. So you can encapsulate all of these into a pipeline object by calling make pipeline, then the transformers, and then the model. Then what happens during fit is that first the first step in the pipeline, uh, the model gets built, it gets fitted on the uh, training data. Then this first step of the pipeline, T1 is used to transform the data from X into X1. Then the second step, T2 is fitted on uh, X1. Then T2 is used to transform X1 to X2. And then the model, the final classifier is fitted on X2. So um, basically, if T1 is, um, say, missing value imputation, so first we figure out what are the missing values and how should they be filled in, then we fill them in. Then uh, we look at the scales of the data, then we scale the data with the filled in missing values, and then we apply the classifier. Then if we uh, call predict on the a test data set X prime here, then the pipeline will just apply the transformations it learned on a training set. So fill in the missing values, rescale the data, and then call the predict of the classifier. And this allows us to um, encapsulate relatively complicated workflows very easily in like a single Python object. We can then even combine this pipelining ability with um, the ability to do parameter searches with grid search. CV. So here's an example where let's say we have a standard scalar which does scaling to zero mean unit variance. And we want to use this pre processing together with a support vector machine as a classifier. So then we can call uh, make pipeline to create a pipeline with this one transformation and then this classifier. If you call fit, um, first, the scale of the data will be estimated, data will be scaled, and then the model will be built on the scaled data. If we call predict, the test data will be scaled, and um, prediction will be made using the model. Now, um, we can use grid search CV again sorry, um, to adjust the parameters of this model and the pipeline. So now, instead of providing the SVC to the uh, grid search, we can uh, use the scalar pipe, which is uh, a pipeline of a standard scalar and the SVC that are, that are created here, and um, create a grid search object from that. Uh, again, we need to pass a parameter grid with the parameters we want to try out. They need to be prefixed with uh, the name of the step inside the pipeline. And then we can uh, call uh, fit again. And now on each iteration, grid search CV uh, will fit the whole pipeline, not only the model, but estimate the, sc uh, the scale separately for each split of the training data. So that was probably um, pretty quick. I'm going to see if there's any questions. I don't see any. Um, so this was yeah a very brief overview of sort of what's in scikit-learn and how is it usually used. Now I want to talk a little bit about um, new and upcoming features. So as I said earlier, we're working on the release uh, 0 0.20 right now. So that's the 20th version of scikit-learn. And um, there's right now there's a release candidate. And if you want to install a release candidate, here's sort of the lines how to do it. If you use Conda, you can uh, do Conda install scikit-learn equal to 0.20 RC1, and you have to install it from Conda Forge. 
or if you're using pip, you can pip install scikit-learn with a dash dash pre to install a pre-release. Actually, it would be quite helpful for us if you do this, because then this allows us to um, do some final fixes and polishing, incorporate your feedback before we finally release uh, 0 0.20. So now I want to talk about a couple of the features for 0 0.20. Um, there's actually many, many, many new additions and fixes and improvements, and there's no way I can go over all of them. One particular focus for 0 0.20 was to make things easier to use, and um, in particular for people that are not as familiar with machine learning, and also to allow people to do pre-processing in an easier way and in a cleaner way. Before the pre-processing in scikit-learn was like a little bit tricky, I think now with this release, we're doing a much, much better job and making it easy for people to do pre-processing with scikit-learn. So a common pain point for people before was that uh, if you want to do one hot encoding, of categorical variables. We had this one hot encoder. Unfortunately, it only works on integers and not on strings. So often categorical variables are encoded as strings. Say you have users being male or female, and you want to encode this as uh, using one hot encoding as zero and one. This, that was a little bit tricky with scikit-learn before, but now um, basically we completely rewrote the one hot encoder. And so now this is much easier to do. This is not like a great improvement in uh, in machine learning technology, but I think it will make a lot of people's life much easier because a lot of people had custom code to do this. Um, the benefit of using some scikit-learn model for this compared to say um, using get dummies from pandas is that you can now you can put this into scikit-learn pipelines. You can put it into more complex. Um, scikit-learn workflows. So particularly, you can make sure that you apply the same kind of transformation to training and test data sets, which is not as easy if you're uh, using pandas, because pandas doesn't really have these concepts. So yeah, better handling of categorical variables with one hot encoder. Another thing that really, I think, will help people with their pre-processing is a new thing that we call a column transformer. It's similar to something that has been there before called uh, feature union. So the column transformer allows you to apply different transformations or different pre-processing steps to different columns in a columnar data set. So let's say you have a pandas data frame. Here, this example is taken from the um, Titanic data set, which is a, a classical toy example. And some columns in the data sets are age and fair, which are both continuous. Um, and there's categorical features encoded as strings, embark, sex, and P class. So what the uh, column transformer allows us to do, which is shown um, down here, is allows us to do different transformations on these numeric and these categorical features. So we apply uh, what we call the numeric transformer and the numeric features and the categorical transformer and the categorical features. Um, why would you want to do this? Well, uh, for categorical features, you need to do one hot encoding, while for numeric features, you usually need to do scaling, while scaling one hot encoded data doesn't really make sense. Also, you might want to use different imputation strategies for continuous data using the mean or the median is sort of a simple baseline strategy. For categorical data, um, strategies that make more sense is either um, using, just replacing the category with a category missing or filling in with the most common category. And so this is very standard whenever we have uh, a mix of, say, continuous and categorical data, which is very common, but also if you have a mix of, say, categorical and text data or dates or any other kinds of data that need different kinds of pre-processing, you can now much more easily put all of these uh, pre-processing steps together in, um, in a scikit-learn um, object. So here the column transformer assumes that we have uh, as input a pandas data frame 
which is also a slight change uh, for scikit-learn. So scikit-learn so far, um, well, every in or let's say everywhere it's supported using a pandas data frame as X, but it basically completely ignored all the additional information that's in the pandas data frame and just converted it to a plain NumPy array. Here, we are actually making use of uh, the column names. So here, this age, fair, and bar CXP class, these are the column names in um, the input, which is a pandas data frame. So again, here, not like any great new uh, novelty of machine learning, but tools to make your pre-processing uh, hopefully easier and less painful and help integrate um, your possible data munging with pandas better with scikit-learn. So these two were like really very simple infrastructure. There's also a little bit more sort of advanced pre-processing things that we added. Uh, for example, the power transformer. So the power transformer implements two um, common transformations of the data that are often used as pre-processing, particular for linear models. The idea of the power transformer is to do well, a power transformation, which is usually taking the data to some power. So you can see here on the right, there's a formula, which is an example of the Boxcox transformation. And the goal is to make the data more normal. So here you can see an example with three different um, data distributions. So uh, this is univariate data. So we're looking at a single feature at a time. And if you look at, uh, so the first column is a single feature with a log normal distribution, then a single feature with a chi square distribution, and a single feature with a Weibull distribution. And so uh, the power transformer implements um, the two transformations that are shown next, the Boxcox transformation and the Geo Johnson transformation. So both of these try to estimate this lambda in the power transformation with the goal to make the data as normal as possible. And so um, as you can see, so before these distribution were all pretty skewed. After the transformation, they're less skewed. In this case here, um, the Boxcox transformation has a pretty good job. The main difference between Boxcox and Geo Johnson is that Boxcox can only be applied to positive data. And so for these uh, three distributions here, they're positive, so that's not an issue. But if you have um, data that's not positive and there's no obvious way to shift the data, using the Geo Johnson method might be better. Finally, we also have um, as comparison the quantile transformer, which is implemented in the quantile transformer, uh, which is a non-parametric way to um, try to make the data more normal or transform the marginals in a dis distribution using quantiles. So obviously for all of these things, you can look at the, our change log, our what's new and the documentation and get much more detail about this. This is uh, this graph here is taken from one of the examples. And if you look at the example, um, there's much more information about uh, how these transformations work. Another kind of uh, pre-processing that we improved is treatment of missing, missing values. So there's basically three things we did. A, all the scalars, like the min-max scalar, standard scalar, robust scalar, and so on, they all allow having missing values in the data now. So before, basically, you needed to get rid of uh, missing values in the data before you could do anything with it. The problem with this is that some of the um, imputation methods actually make use of the scale of the data. If you use uh, K and N imputation, for example, it's important that you scale the data before you do the imputation. That's generally the case if you do any model-based imputation that's not using trees. So now you can apply the scikit-learn scalars um, before imputing your missing values or filling in your missing values in some way. And basically they during fitting, they just all ignore the missing values. We also slightly changed the behavior of what we had as imputer before. So now we have what's called a simple imputer, 
which only has some very simple strategies. So it's a slight um, simplification of what we had in Imputer, but we'll also add some more um, complex model-based imputation strategies we're working on right now. So now there's a simple Imputer, which is in the uh, Impute module before we had the Imputer, which was in the pre-processing module. So the change in behavior is minor and it's like more to refactor the code, but um, we have several things in the pipeline to add more different imputation methods to scikit-learn. In a similar uh, vein, we also added um, a transformation. It's called missing indicator. And that basically, in addition to allowing us to impute data, also allows us to record when have values been imputed. Often, data is not missing as ran at random. And if a value is missing, that will tell you something about the data point. And so this missing indicator is just sort of a quick helper to help you add uh, binary features, whether a given feature was imputed or not. Also related to pre-processing, but uh, this time for the target variable and regression is the transform target regressor. So this is another uh, building block, basically that we can use to um, transform the target uh, before we build the model and after prediction. So let's say here, there's, um, this is the prediction on the Boston housing data set, I think, and uh, we want to predict the price of a house. And you can see that, um, well, the distribution of house prices is very skewed. And you can see that if you look at uh, a model that was built with the linear model uh, ridge, uh, on the left-hand side, the predictions have a systematic error because of how skewed the distribution of targets is. It's actually much easier to predict uh, the log of the house value instead of predicting the house value itself. And it's very common that if the target distribution is skewed, applying some transformation to the target distribution or to the target um, helps make it easier. So on the right-hand side, here you see basically the result using a transformation where uh, we applied logarithm to the data, built a model on the logarithmic data, and then transfer back the data uh, after the prediction was made. And you can see at least in terms of mean absolute error, um, this is uh, quite a bit better. And you can see that um, there's no systematic skew in the data anymore, or at least uh, not as much as there was before. Again, this is something that you could have um, kind of easily done yourself, but here again, it's helpful to have this inside scikit learn so you can use this together with pipelines and with other tools like parameter tuning. So this is not really easy to do if you want to do a grid search, for example. So having this tool to do this transformation um, within the grid search is very helpful. So this was, I think, most of the pre-processing tools or some of the larger changes in the pre-processing tools. Um, and now I want to talk about some other additions. So one addition I'm quite excited about is that we added a data set loader um, for the OpenML platform. So as you might know, there are several like built-in toy data sets in scikit-learn. There's also some functions to easily fetch data sets uh, from online. For example, if you want to download MNIST or something like this, or there's uh, functions for um, cover type and um, yeah, several other popular benchmark data sets. We also had um, a function to fetch data from a platform called ML Data, which had like uh, many data sets, like, uh, I think like in the thousands. The problem was this platform was no longer maintained and it was basically impossible to upload new data there. So instead, we're now using uh, OpenML to host data sets. OpenML is a project um, that not only hosts, hosts um, data sets, it also allows you to create tasks on this data set. So it's uh, specify what is the machine learning problem associated with this data set? Is it a classification regression task? What is the target column and so on? And uh, then once you run a machine learning algorithm, it also allows you to upload the results. 
So you can see there's about uh, 20,000 data sets on OpenML, and there's um, around 8.5 million runs. Each of these runs is someone applying a machine learning model on the data set and then uploading the results. This is great because it allows us to more systematically benchmark which algorithms perform well and in what setting and what hyperparameters are important and what are good hyperparameter settings. Um, so if you use it with scikit-learn, it'll actually not upload any of your data. Um, in scikit-learn, we're just using this to uh, fetch any of the data sets that are, that are on OpenML. If there's any data sets that you commonly use, um, for example, in teaching or in workshops or uh, in your research, then you can also just upload them to OpenML and then can, everybody can get them very easily just by specifying the name. Generally, if you have any interesting machine learning data sets, please upload them to OpenML because that um, allows machine learning practitioners and like library developers like me to run more benchmarks and more kind of different data sets. If you actually want to use the file functionality of OpenML, you have to use the OpenML Python package, which is also pretty easy to use. This would allow you to actually upload your results. A little bit more in the back end is a change that's um, possibly not as visible for users. We uh, upgraded joblib, which is what we use for um, multiprocessing and serialization. And joblib just included a new tool um, actually developed by some of the scikit-learn developers in Paris, particularly Olivier Crizet, um, called Loki. Loki is an alternative for, or a replacement for a multiprocessing pool and the concurrent futures process pool executor. So these are, well, multiprocessing pools that handle the different processes. We need this replacement because um, the core Python and multiprocessing uh, pool were not very robust. There were problems on several platforms that, um, well, on Windows, for example, if you have a script, you need to pr uh, protect anything in the script with a uh, clause name equal or equal main. Otherwise, you'll not be able to um, uh, to use um, parallelism. Actually, par if you try to use parallelism like grid search with n jobs greater than one, and you don't do this on Windows, uh, it'll crash. Also, um, there's some. Uh, linear algebra libraries that didn't really work well with the uh, standard Python multiprocessing tool, uh, pool. Um, for example, uh, the Accelerate framework that Apple used to use, um, I don't think they're using it anymore, but basically you would get random crashes um, on your Mac as soon as you used n jobs greater than one, and so that's no longer the case. Also, if you have any backends that use um, OpenMP or um, any other multi-threading that used to cause crashes with the standard multiprocessing pool. So a lot of people reported that if they used, uh, say, XGBoost or TensorFlow or Keras inside a grid search CV um, with n jobs greater than one, they all get a crash. The reason is because the OpenMP, which is the parallelism or the low-level parallelism used in these libraries, uh, was basically incompatible with the multiprocessing that Python does. And so that led to a crash. And so basically, we got rid of all of these. And now we can use um, the Python multiprocessing, or the more uh, correctly, the Loki multiprocessing pool, together with these low level libraries like OpenMP to uh, speed up things even further. Another thing that's a little bit more uh, behind the scenes is that we introduced um, a global configuration for scikit-learn with that you can use with either sklearn.config context or sklearn.setconfig, either to set a global state or to use a context manager. And uh, this currently allows setting two options, uh, both of which are basically um, ways to increase speed or decrease memory, memory consumption. The first one is assume finite. So 
one of the things that, that we do in scikit-learn is that we check input that is actually valid before we apply any model. We particularly check that all the input is not inf or none. If you have um, very strong time constraints, checking whether your input is infinite or none might actually take a significant amount of time if your data set is big and if the, other, the rest of your computation is fast. If you set assume finite to true, then you can basically skip this part of the input validation. And in some cases, that gives you um, very big performance increases. It's kind of, yeah, it's kind of a little bit um, silly to think that this check in um, for finiteness is actually what's slow in a machine learning algorithm. But if your data is big and your model is fast, this is actually the case. So if you really, really need to um, speed up your algorithms and you know the input is valid, set assume finite to false, uh, true, sorry. The other option is uh, working memory. The idea behind working memory is that we want to limit the amount of RAM that scikit-learn uses. A lot of the machine learning algorithms can be very RAM hungry, and we don't want to um, crash your computer because we're using up all your RAM. Uh, right now, this is not respected everywhere in scikit-learn. We're still working on this, so it would be great to actually enforce a global memory limit, uh, but that's very tricky. Right now, this is, um, as far as I know, mostly used in distance-based algorithms. And um, so often if you have to compute a very big distance matrix between all pairs of points, this can uh, potentially be a very large matrix. Let's say you want to compute all, um, like, or the nearest neighbor for every point in a data set with a million points. If you're not careful, you could allocate a million times a million matrix, and uh, that's already quite a lot of memory. So here what working memory does is, in the case that where a result would take too much memory, or an intermediate result would take too much memory, we're actually chunking the data or uh, using batches so we're breaking up the computation in smaller pieces that potentially might make it a little bit slower, but it prevents you from, um, yeah, from blowing up your memory and crushing everything. So, but as I said, this is only done mostly in distance computations and nearest neighbor computations. So um, there's no guarantee right now that if you set a working memory limit, that there's not some other ca uh, place um, where the memory might blow up. So now um, I want to talk a little bit about some uh, improvements to some of the models. Uh, again, this is more sort of usability and enhancements and improvements. So we have um, early stopping now, both for gradient boosting and for um, stochastic gradient descent. So the idea is that you can specify a validation fraction, uh, a variable and iter no change and a tolerance, and basically, Using a holdout validation set, you can stop uh, building the model once the tolerance did, uh, once you change less than a tolerance for n iter no change iterations. So here, for example, um, we have a validation fraction of 0.2, n iter no change is 5, and tolerance is 0 0.01. And so that means if in the last five iterations on our validation set, the tolerance or sorry, the, the accuracy does, didn't improve by more than 0 0.01, then, um, then we just stop building the algorithm. And you can see some, some examples below that basically if you set the number for gradient boosting, this early stopping is the number of estimators. So basically it stops adding more trees once, um, once you're done, or sorry, once you're done improve on the validation set. Downside of this, of course, is that you decrease the training set size because you have some holdout validation set. But you can see that here on a digits data set, um, instead of using 500 um, trees, we are using only 150 trees. And um, so it would take only about half of the time. Uh, 
So we have something very similar in um, stochastic gradient descent and, from, uh, and similar models like the perceptron and the passive aggressive classifier and regressor. And again, you have the same parameters. Um, you can ha have a validation fraction and uh, this is holdout data. And once um, there's no improvement on the holdout data or less than tolerance, then uh, we just stop building the model. And this can not only speed up learning, it can also act as a regularizer. In the SGD classifiers here, this is, again, it's the number of iterations, but that means passes over the data set in doing the optimization. Um, another improvement that is, I think is pretty great, it was done by uh, Joel Nothman, was we added to our already like pretty extensive docs a new page uh, called the glossary, um, which basically explains all the terms used in scikit-learn in the documentation. We already have a lot of slang words. I probably used in this talk way too many slang words that uh, someone that doesn't work on scikit-learn all day long uh, doesn't understand. Like, what do we mean by estimator, for example? Um, what is a cross-validation object and so on? And this glossary tries to be very comprehensive in trying to explore uh, explain all these terms that we use all the time. Finally, some very sort of minor changes that I hope will um, make scikit-learn much more usable, which is having better default parameters. So doing some uh, surveys on GitHub and doing some code searches, we found that most people use their machine learning algorithms with the default parameters, which is usually a pretty bad idea. Usually you want to uh, use something like randomized search or grid search to adjust your parameters. But given that um, so many people use the default parameters, we try to put a little bit more effort into giving you good parameters. For example, all random forest based models now have the number of estimators be 100 instead of 10. Um, for cross-validation, instead of doing three-fold cross-validation by default, we do five-fold uh, cross-validation. And in grid search, where we had, well, this is not really a hyperparameter, but we had um, a reweighting of the data enabled uh, in case the different folds are different size, and we'll, we'll disable that in the future. Whenever I say, oh, we make this change, what it means is we deprecated the current value and it'll change in the future. So um, what this means is we now decided in the random forest, the number of trees in the forest by default should go to 100. But we're not, we didn't change it as at, in 0 0.20, because if we change this now, people's, the behavior of people's code would change. And a lot of people would get very upset because their models change. And if you use cycle learning production, that can have very bad um, consequences. So what we're doing is if you're using a default parameter, uh, we start warning you that it's going to change. We're going to start warning in 0 0.20. We're going to keep warning in 0 0.21. And then in 0 0.22, we actually make the change and the warning will disappear. And so, um, yeah, we did this for a couple of parameter settings. I think the number of estimators in the random force and the cross validation are probably the most important ones. Um, oh yeah, so, well, and another very important one where we changed uh, the default parameters is for logistic regression, where we changed the solver to LBFGS and multi-class to auto. So the main change here is while we're using a different method to um, compute the coefficients behind the scenes, but um, we'll change the multi-class method to uh, use multinomial logistic regression in the multi-class case. So if you have more than two classes, in the future, it'll use multinomial logistic regression. Before, or in the current version, it uses uh, one versus rest. So it does binary logistic regression in a one versus rest fashion. That's really weird. And the reason why we had this so far is because that's the default in liblinear. And liblinear is the first um, algorithm for logistic regression that we had. Because this behavior is kind of unexpected and weird, we want to change this now to uh, use multinomial logistic regression in a multi-class setting. 
And again, these are changes that will actually happen in 0 0.22. So these are changes we're going to warn you about um, that we're going to change them. And so I don't like to see warnings in my code. I'm pretty sure you don't like to see warnings in your code as well. Um, if you upgrade scikit-learn, you might see a bunch of these warnings because if you use logistic regression or if you use grid search CV or um, uh, if you use random forest and you use the default parameters, you will now see a warning that the default parameters will change. As I said, um, we sort of we have to do this because we don't want to change the behavior of any people's anyone's code um, without giving them warning to adjust. You, there's a pretty easy way to avoid these warnings if you just set the parameters yourself. So for example, for the cross-validation, if you set a, a number of cross-validation folds to five by yourself, which is what you should have done in the, uh, from the start, then you will not see the warning anymore. Similarly, for random force, if you set the number of estimators to anything, um, like you can even set it to 10, and you will not see the warning anymore. Though I highly recommend you set it to 100 or more. Basically, only if you don't touch the parameter setting, only then you will see the warning. And you can avoid the warnings by setting the parameters explicitly. This will protect you from uh, the behavior of your code changing once you upgrade. So you should now make sure that there is no warnings in your code. And then if you do that, the behavior of your code will stay the same in the future. I feel like I'm running out of time, but I want to uh, give some uh, brief ideas of what we're working on um, right now and what we will we'll be working on in the future with scikit-learn. Uh, one thing we've been working on is actually a draft roadmap. So for the first time in the history of scikit-learn, we have something like a roadmap or plan. I mean, we usually we used to have a plan at all times, but the plan was sort of in the heads of the core developers. And it's very hard um, for other people to sort of see what our direction is and um, to possibly plan or to contribute or to say, well, we think uh, this other thing is very important. So now we actually wrote down our roadmap, um, which also sort of uh, forces us to agree on what the roadmap is. Right now, it's a very early draft, which we really haven't publicized so far. But if you want, you can go on the scikit-learn uh, wiki and look at the draft roadmap and make comments and um, tell us what you think is important, what you think is not important. Um, one change for the next version, um, so not 020, but 021, um, will be that we are dropping Python 2.7 and 3.4. In particular, that means we are dropping support for Python 2. Um, at the end of this year, NumPy will drop support for Python 2.7. Uh, 2.7. Matplotlib already dropped support for Python 2.7. So um, basically, uh, the whole stack is moving away from Python 2. And so we're also uh, dropping 2.7, which will make our lives a lot easier. And so if you haven't upgraded to Python 3 yet, please do so. Um, yeah, another thing I mentioned already is that we um, have this new multiprocessing backend, Loki. This will actually enable us to use OpenMP in scikit-learn. So, so to do low-level parallelism scikit-learn, which we couldn't do so far. This will allow us to speed up many of the algorithms like uh, support vector machines or building decision trees. And that's definitely something we're actively working on. We're also working on um, including some features of the imbalanced learn library. So right now, there's uh, in the scikit-learn contract repository, there's a library called imbalanced learn. It helps you to resample imbalanced data sets and deal with imbalanced data sets. Um, we think this is some of these features are quite important. And so one, we want to port them into main scikit-learn. I also want to keep working on uh, integration of uh, pandas and scikit-learn. So we have this column transformer um, right now. It's still a little bit tricky to actually get the feature names from a column transformer. So I would like us to store all the names of all the columns and to be able, if we have a pretty complexing, uh, complex processing uh, pipeline, to make sure that we 
understand what are the features that arrive at the final model. So if the final model is the logistic regression that gets some input features, I want to understand what was exactly the processing steps that it was applied to each of these features, where did it originally come from? Right now, this is a little bit hard to trace, and uh, we're working on making this better. Oh, in case you want to learn more about scikit-learn, we obviously we have the documentation online, and there's lots of free videos online. Um, but I also wrote a book together with Sarah Guido, uh, Introduction to Machine Learning with Python, and um, so which is also um, more or less a guide to scikit-learn and uh, how to do machine learning with scikit-learn. All right. Um, that's all that I had for today. I'm going to go back to the uh, chat now. Let's see if anyone wrote anything there uh, for a brief Q&A. Okay, there was one more change that I skipped, which is very important. So while you think about your question, um, I'll show you this most important change in the library. So if you, I don't, if you do machine learning, you're probably familiar with the IRIS data set. And so there was a bug in IRIS, and we changed these three places in IRIS. So there's uh, there was a measurement that was supposed to be 0 0.1, and uh, sorry, was supposed to be 0 0.2 and was 0 0.1. And there were these two other me measurements, which were off by uh, 0.1 and 0.6, uh, 0.5. And um, you might ask yourself, why is IRIS wrong? And um, turns out the platform um, that we got this from, the uh, UCI database of machine learning uh, data sets, actually has this, uh, has this error. Someone that typed down the measurements must have made this error, like, I don't know, whenever UCI was created. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. someone from the R community, uh, I think, um, like, found this discrepancy. And um, so I think you have to look very long and hard on uh, to at Iris to find this kind of uh, issues. Anyway, so if your results on Iris change, a don't be surprised. B don't use Iris ever. So I haven't. I have taken none of them nano degrees. I think a couple of people have um, asked like. Of the people creating a nano degrees uh, asked my opinion and I gave them my feedback, but really um, it's very hard for me to say uh, because I haven't taken them. So my book is really mo mostly about the programming aspects, which I think are quite important. But if you want to really dive into machine learning, you should also learn more about like the math behind it. There's a great book called Elements of Statistical Learning. Um, the authors have it for free on their website. Um, by uh, Trevor Hasty uh, and Tipshibani. And that's really a, a great resource, I think. And so this requires a little bit of stats knowledge, but it's not too hard to read and has a lot of amazing insights. And I think it's very good to pair this with my O'Reilly book. Of course, my book was intentionally written um, to not have any formulas. It's called Elements of Statistical Learning. There's also like, I mean, there's um, a lot of courses online that I've heard good things about. For example, like the um, Coursera course on machine learning by Andre Ng. Um, but well, I think um, if you do a full degree, then uh, this will give you more time to really focus on these, these things. So, I mean, I did a PhD in machine learning, so that uh, means I, thought about some of these issues for uh, four years, um, I think four. Um, so it, I mean, doing um, a nano degree or a boot camp can definitely get you started. Um, but sort of the more time you spend on the problems, I think the more insight you will get. Obviously not everybody can like take time out to um, go back to school or something like this. There's, I think, a lot of jobs. Yes, that's the link. Um, I mean, there's probably a lot of jobs where doing a nano degree or doing a boot camp will allow you to transition to uh, like data science, machine learning. Just don't expect to be hired as like a, a researcher at Facebook. There's actually another. 
good machine learning book online by I'm going to post the link to another good machine learning uh, book here. That's done by Hal, who's a, a researcher at Microsoft. Well, last time I checked, at least. And he's very good, and he put this um, whole book on machine learning online. Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining and listening.